everybody welcome back it's monday here good morning good afternoon and maybe even good evening wherever you are and wherever you're listening to this podcast we are back it's farm to the show with my dear friend mr paul yanish lover of all things checks mex crossword and a man that is deep as the ocean i'm chris diggerson we're both former reds i personally am a disabled list uh all-american world champion <laughs> and uh yeah, just, uh, you know, all around uh, chit chatter. So we're back. This is Paul. What what show is this? Are we on five right now? No, I think we're on four, bud. I, I think, think we're, we're on four. On, I think we're on four. Yeah. Good, um, to, good, to, good to see you, though. It's called the injured list now, Dickie. Oh, the, the injured, injured list. Injured, yes. Injured list. Yeah, the injured list. So, yes, I would be uh, I'd be an injured list um, a Hall of Famer. And H-O-F. so we're back. Um, busy weekend. Uh, we're going to jump right into world baseball classic today. You know, we always try to put together a, um, you know, pretty, a pretty lengthy kind of show program, you know, touching on a top couple topics. But the fact of the matter is this, the WBC has been, has been something we haven't seen before in the past. And I feel like we're, we're finally, this tournament is finally at the point where it is in, in full scale adoption, from both American and uh, and and ju- just the baseball world, and it's it's been amazing to see the the reaction, just the the turnout at at, at these games from the first group stage games in Arizona to that field being packed um, was was impressive. And there's no longer an argument that these are uh, meaningless uh exhibition games not when you have 50,000 fans for for group stage and you've had the playoff world championship you know world cup atmosphere going on in in Florida and there's just absolutely no better place to 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 hype up the you know the latin demographic for the game of baseball than having those games in Miami and it's been absolutely electric to watch yeah for sure so a couple things man like it- the WBC obviously has taken on a, a, a pretty global effect at this point and from, from, from a couple of different angles, right? Like you got the Czech Republic team who got in, you got guys that are, they did a really cool bit on that with, you know, some of the guys professions, you got teachers, you got guys that are working in industrial shops and side note, Dickie, I've actually been asked to play on the Czech Republic team the last couple of times. So, you know, I'm, I'm in on the Czech Republic uh, getting into the, into the, the big stage so that they could, kind of kind of continue to spread the seed of baseball globally which is is just really cool to see but and and i totally agree with you man you we're, we're past the point of i think people being able to say that hey it's a bigger deal to the other countries than it is to the u.s because i mean you don't have to look very far along the usa roster to see look man we it's it's it, it, at least on the position player side man that's kind of our best bullet i think that you could really hope for from an offensive lineup and you know, obviously Trey Turner hits the big homer, a big grand slam the other night to take the lead in a in a huge moment late in the game against Venezuela. And you know, I always joke about this dynamic, but I think it is so cool to see rich guys get that fired up, right? And so you can't tell me that they're not taking it seriously and that it's not a big deal. And from a fan's perspective, I don't care where you're from or who you're rooting for, it's really hard to 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 believe that this is not really, really good for the entire game of baseball. Yeah, hundred percent. I've I've been so fortunate uh, back in the day. Rick Vandenherk, which was uh, one of the first Dutch pitchers to play in the big leagues, and it was his dream to see more opportunities for European countries and to expand the game of baseball throughout throughout the world. And so he started this incredible uh, program called the European European Big League Tour. He started in two thousand ten, and the first people that went over. Uh, you'll love this. The first people that went over were Dexter Fowler, Mike Stanton, or Gian. I call him Mike, Mike Stanton, <laughs> uh, Prince Fielder, Andrew McCutcheon, uh, Jeremy Guthrie, and the particular stops. They did two in Holland, of course, in um, in I believe it was one was in Amsterdam and one was in uh, Rotterdam at the okay. at the sports center. And then the two other stops were in uh, were in Czech, uh, were in the Czech, Czech Republic, were in Prague. Yep and uh rome italy and so this was 2010 and when i saw that the czech republic had qualified i text prince and i said hey have you thought about this has have you connected the dots that essentially like these same individuals that were six and seven years old young kids that you inspired them 
to continue playing baseball and looking at the dynamic of getting great international players across abroad to grow the game of the ba- baseball and inspire the, you know, the, these, these youth around the world to, to pick up the game, but also just to learn from the best uh, from a de- development standpoint. And he, you know, he giggled and he was like, I never thought about that, but it's pretty amazing to think about that was one of the first, first stops, uh, what I thought was a very poignant, uh, move to to grow the game and you look at what's happened with the NBA and how well they've done because they've made an incredible strategy to go to Africa to go to the Asian markets to do these exhibitions and to get their best players and their superstars over there to do these camps and clinics and now you see that they're absolutely mad about basketball and I think that if we can continue to do things like that you'll see more of these teams pop up and there'll be greater competition, uh, very similar to the you know, Czech Republic and Italy and Germany and all these teams that you don't necessarily think that have uh, a presence in it, with a baseball presence. But it's alive and well. And they the tournament this year has shown that how competitive these teams are starting to become year after year. And it wasn't like that in 2010 when we were doing exhibitions during spring training and we were watching a young Kenley Jansen, who was a nobody at the time, <laughs> who was still playing catcher. He was a catcher throwing, that couldn't hit. <laughs> could, oh my gosh. I won't. It's it's bizarre that I even remember that. I think I was just so impressed with when Kenley was throwing down to second base. He was throwing stuff that was on a line three feet high. And then when he got up to bat, he I mean, he was hitting stuff off his knuckles. It was just, it was bad. But seeing where that where that team is and the influence of of them being you know the you know the king of europe uh in with the netherlands and raising the bar of competition to seeing what's happened uh this past tournament it's it's been phenomenal to watch with mexico making a serious run at it and uh we we've, we've had huge games over the weekend that we'll that we'll get into but the dynamic of international baseball is alive and well and it's been on it's been on uh f- full display over the last week and a half and it's been it's been great to see yeah no it's great man and to your point going back to the you know prince fielder going uh, going over there you know 10 12 years ago but the platform right like i don't think as as players we don't always understand the the scope of the influence that, you know, that we may have and, and whether that was in the Czech Republic with guys that were six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old at the time or whatever. But um, I look at it from, you know, I've, I've got an 11 year old and a 10 year old boy and a, and a, and a six year old girl. And, but my boys are eating up with baseball. They're, they can, they're fired up by the WBC. They can't believe it. He's, he's impersonating Trey Turner hitting the grand slam, the whole deal. Right. And like, I mean, obviously that's the U S and that's my kid. So it hits close to home, but that's happening all over the world, man. Like, you know, the, the game becoming global like that, like you're referencing basketball, you know, you got obviously Shohei is one of the biggest stars here who started in Japan. And now you got the Sasaki guy who sounds like maybe he's going to follow in his footsteps here in a couple of years. It's uh, it's just really cool to see. And I mean, to be honest, it's just exciting. And at the end of the day, that's what it's about. It's, it's about the game and being global and hopefully providing the opportunity for people from all over the world to aspire, you know, to, to, to come over here and play at some point. And I'd be interested to see what the dynamic is this year, as opposed to the, the adoption of past years. And maybe it is based on the, the locale of these games and being in Miami, um, knowing that you have so many Latin American teams and it's such a huge Latin American influence in Miami. And I think that's what the biggest thing is because when they drop that first Puerto Rico, Venezuela, um, and that Dominican Puerto Rico game, that looked like an, that I mean, it looked like a World Series game. That that energy was incredible. And if you've ever paid attention to, or I, I've personally uh, played in the Dominican, and understanding that that atmosphere and bringing that on a massive scale to Lone Depot Park is was incredible to watch. So bring putting that passion that these countries have on display for the game and putting that in you know the brightest lights on the biggest platform possible. Uh, it's incredible. And not to say that it hasn't come with, with some drama, uh, with the DR team and the, you know, a lot of this stuff that goes, goes behind the scenes and with just managing all these superstars, managing the players, the lineup and, you know, everybody, you know, pointing fingers as to, you know, who's, who's to blame at the end of the day. (laughs) And, uh, you know, and it's difficult, but it's, it's, if that's how we look at it, we look at the world cup, we look at, uh, we look at the world cup, we look at the Olympic basketball team, 
over the last 10 years. And that's a big thing is when you get the best of the best and there's such an incredible concentration of superstars in a particular country, you know, if you don't win it, there are going to be some fingers pointed. So DR going out of the tournament really quick, you know, that's, that's been an issue. And there's been some, some, you know, there's been some, uh, you know, chirping coming out, coming out of that camp is some, what have, what may have gone wrong. But the fact of the matter is, you have, you know, putting the best lineup out there, it, it comes down to, to player performance. And you see the U.S. kind of getting off to a rocky start and losing to Mexico and kind of being in a position where they have, were in a must a must win position at, at right. one point. And the, and for the people out there, if you guys don't if you guys don't know, is that Japan is five and zero right now. And mm-hmm. there's a reason behind that, I, I personally think, is the fact they their well, spring training the starts so early. Yeah, they're five and zero, Dicky, because they haven't lost yet. That's why they're five and zero. Well, yeah, they're <laughs> legit number one. But you know, looking at these Latin teams, they've been playing winter ball. Some of these guys are fresh out of the Caribbean series, so they they have at bats. They're coming in a spring training hot. Um, and you know, Japan they start their spring training a couple weeks earlier, so they're already kind of for sure. You know, they're they're yeah. they're in the mode a little bit. And by the time they get in the the World Baseball Classic, this competition and at bats and their their pitchers are a little bit more dialed in uh, than some than some of the other teams, and I think that showed in the tournament. Where they've been they've been untouchable. Yeah, I, I'm to that point, Dickie. So my wife played soccer in college. She's a big soccer fan. The World Cup's a big deal at our house, just like I know it is for yourself um, and globally, for that matter. But as the WBC unfolds, and we can already tell, like it's a big it's as big a deal now to the players as it's ever been, and I'm sure that's going to continue to grow, but you know, whether or not the timing of the tournament changes or if there's other implications for guys maybe trying to do a little bit more prep relative to, to when the tournament happens, kind of like what you're saying, Japan's kind of turning on all turning and burning on all cylinders because their guys are locked in and you and I can attest like the timing in particular offensively is it, it, that's a big deal, man. Like that doesn't, you don't just show up and you're ready to go. You got to get some at bats and you got to see some pitches and we can say whatever we want, but like the, this time of year is not generally when guys are locked into what I would call quote unquote playoff baseball. Well, the WBC is changing that because these games are big. The guys are obviously, you know, the emotion involved with these games is a playoff atmosphere. There's no two ways about it. So I'm curious to see over the course of time, how, how, you know, different teams, different countries, different players combat that, that aspect. Yeah, and for and from what I understand, I think uh, one of the issues was is that when you're putting these teams together, you're getting you're getting guys notice. Hey, you know we're going to pick you for the roster. Hey, get ready. So they're making those preparations two weeks, three weeks out, and if they're in the DR, they're coming you know back to the states to get their training to, to you know to get a couple extra workouts or do whatever. So their their schedule is now evolving around prepping for the tournament, and when things go awry. I know I think that's been some of the disappointment over in that in that camp, but to show where the, what the selection process is it is and what the preparation behind the World Baseball Classic is, is that it's not something that you got you're just showing up for. This is something that guys are preparing mentally and physically to be a couple weeks ahead to where they're in a position to go in and compete at the highest level against the best competition in the world. And when you would otherwise have you know, come in, come and get to it, two ABs, you know, your spring training, two ABs, it's probably against a, you know, a prospect, a double A kid sure. who's making his first start. He is not necessarily polished or ready to get in the big leagues, but those are the, those type of starts that these, that this spring training you'll, you're, uh, you've grown accustomed to is right. having these young prospects that are, that are on the verge of getting the big leagues. And when you're in the world baseball classic, your first at bat is going to be against Shohei. Or it's going to be against a veteran guy like Wayno, or it's going to be Nick Martinez and some of these more established guys. The American guys may not be that sharp, but you know, if you're going again, you know, Venezuela, that's the best that they have. That's the best that they have. There is no, right. you know, kind of putting your toe in the water and wading into it. You're thrown into the deep end. You're going, it's best of the best early in the tournament when otherwise you would just be getting acclimated to, to live ABs. Yeah, yeah. I, I love it. I think the atmosphere is great. Like I said, I, I'm sitting here with my kids watching it. They're all fired up about it. So I can only imagine what it's doing across the country for, you know, for the the fans of the game, young and old. But um, let's touch on a couple of the, you know, so we've had a couple of pretty significant injuries. I, I'm, you know, I'm doing the show here from Houston, Texas. So it's Astros 
um, you know, deal and we get a lot of news. But so Jose Altuve gets hit by a pitch the other night, breaks his thumb. Sounds like he's probably going to have to have surgery and miss uh, the season potentially. We obviously got the closer for the Mets, Edwin Diaz, you know, in a seemingly, you know, uneventful type celebration, does the patella in his knee and is out for the year, right? So I'm curious to hear your, you know, we're, 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 we're saying a lot of good things about the WBC, which are all true, but I'm curious to hear your feedback on some of the significant players, because obviously you're playing real games. The chance of injury is real. You know, that's, that's going to influence the big league season and in these, with these two examples, potentially in a very large way. So what's your, what are your thoughts on, on, on that side of it as well? I think it's in a position to where, you know, we're going to look at the timing and, and there is no good timing. If you're playing an international tournament, it's just, it's, it's what's going to happen. It's no different than Chris Paul with the, with the, you know, with the redeem team coming back and what he was coming, you know, coming back from his broken thumb, maybe pushing it a little bit too hard, potentially re-injuring it, going to the world cup and playing extra games and having half the French, the French team get injured either in training um, there, there's no, there's no win. There's no answer for it. The, the, the guys are going to get hurt, um, in, you know, in the heat of competition, it was unfortunate that, uh, you know, that, that Jose got hit, but that's, you know, that's, that's the game and, you know, having a fastball run it, run up inside of you, it's not intentional, but it's, that's the nature of the game. However, the celebration, that's kind of a freak thing that, that honestly reminded me of Kendry Morales, yeah. When he hit the when yeah. he hit the walk off grand slam and in celebration jumping on the whole home plate and breaking his leg, it's so unfortunate and it's a highly you know uncircumstantial type of thing where you can't point a finger and be like okay this is why we shouldn't play this it's going to happen regardless and the fact of the matter is like I've seen Marcus Stroman blow out his knee blow out his ACL within the first five days of camp doing PFPs and nobody's going to sit there and point fingers and be like okay well why are we you know how does that happen. It's, it's the nature of the game. You're out there. We're prepping. You're, you're doing your work. You're celebrating because that's, you know, that's what we do. And uh, whatever comes out of that is, I feel like, is, is just is the, natural, is the natural ebb and flow of the game and, and part of the circumstance of playing high level elite, elite competition. And while it is unfortunate and on, on two sides is, for me, and we we touched on this before the show, and I won't we won't get too far into it, but for me, watching what happened to Daniel Bard, having this flashback, the unfortunate circumstance of Altuve missing extended time, but also seeing the flashback of Daniel Bard, while it's so incredibly exceptional and important to note the the Daniel Bard's journey of taking so much time off uh, after after being away of the game to come back, be at the highest level. And then not only that, but come back and represent your country in this tournament is an exceptional, absolutely an exceptional feat, uh, what he was able to achieve, but also, uh, you know, looking at that and seeing the, you know, I, I was able to see that up close and Daniel Bard's uh, meltdown in, in the minor leagues and seeing kind of that rear its ugly head um, a couple nights ago was, was, was interesting to see and kind of frightening if you think about it is that uh, even at this level, it's uh, something can get away from you and, and go downhill really fast. And it's uh, again, it's unfortunate that it turned into an injury, but um, you no, know. no, I, I don't, I don't know, Bart personally, I've heard good things about him, you know, and to your point about the story, like, I mean, he was the major league comeback player of the year, you know, it's 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 a really really cool story it's 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 i'm super interested to see how it unfolds moving forward you know after the wbc wbc is over and fast forward and back into the regular season um it, it'll be interesting to follow but it's it's uh it, it's it was a pretty cool storyline you know underlying the us usa is obviously pretty significant comeback in the game and then ending up winning the game so that was it was well it, it'll be fun to watch how uh how bart has the opportunity to respond in the regular season yeah, and Daniel, he was an elite talent coming up through the Boston Red Sox system. He was one of the first pitchers we touched on this one of our early shows is uh, the frequency and the the number of guys that throw 100. And back in the day, Daniel Bard was an absolute freak. He was, mm -hmm. you know, 100 miles per hour with movement, and it yeah. was just like something you didn't want to face. And that's kind of one of the things that uh, put us uh, put our attention on what had happened the previous night when Daniel had had a meltdown in uh, in Pawtucket is it's the guy that you least want to face. I mean, this guy was stuff was absolutely 
filthy. And so when you hard. got into when it got into that safe situation, you're like, we just hope that Daniel Bard's not coming out of the out of the pen, and you hope he doesn't have his stuff locked in either. Um, and it was unfortunate that he had uh, one of those episodes that kind of set him on the path to retiring from baseball, and then eventually pursuing a job as a mental skills coach uh, in mm-hmm. the in in organization, and only to come back and have that USA across his chest. I think there's a lot of credit there do. I think we get caught up a lot in the winning and losing and not understanding, you know, not being, um, not being privy to the journey. And I, I get, you know, again, we don't want, we're not trying to give sympathy here, but we want to make people aware of the exceptional story and the exceptional, the exceptional journey that it took yeah. and what that means to be in a position to represent your country in this tournament. That's that has clearly turned into the, global event in world baseball and sure. it's just something you had mentioned earlier is you 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 get no better no better pleasure wa- watching rich guys represent with the with the <laughs> usa on their chest and it's something that i wish i've always could have done is represent you know my country yeah. and it's one thing that i've always loved about the olympics is going and watching the baseball team and the guys represent being dressed up doing the parade and to, to bear your you know to bear the flag and to bear the usa across the chest is 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 100 percent a dream of mine and unfortunate that i get to do it but i i have so much respect um for for those guys that are are chosen and i hope they you know they've represented the flag well and what's impressed me most actually is the guys that were requested i mean like begged and requested to be a part of this as opposed to just getting selected and saying "Ah, i don't want to do it yes i'll do it but there were a couple guys that said you know what this is my last rodeo I understand what this means to me, my career, my country, um, you know, baseball in general. And I, w- I would love to put my talents forward to represent to represent this team this year. Yeah. And I think that's a, an opportunity, a little segue to give, you know, the Mark, Mark DeRosa, DeRosa, uh, obviously played in the big leagues for a long time. He's anybody who's been around the game. He's just a guy's guy. You know, he was a teammate. He was like what I would refer to in a, on a lot of teams that he was on as the glue, you know, one of those kind of clubhouse guys. And, I think it goes a long way that uh, that he's he was the, obviously the manager of the USA team for those of you who who don't know, but having a guy like that that is so approachable that so many people know and like, I think it lends itself to players doing exactly what you just said. Like, I'm gonna pick up the phone, I'm gonna get a hold of somebody that knows D Row, I'm gonna call him and tell him, hey, I want to be on the team, hey, I want to be a part of it, and uh, you know whether that was on purpose or not, I, I'm not sure with regards to putting D Row in the in the captain's chair, but. You know, I, I think that it's it's a pretty cool dynamic when you do have the players and you're hearing these stories about them reaching out to the to the to the manager or the committee and whoever to make sure that, look, I know I don't get to put myself on the team, but I want you to know that I'm a, I, I want to be on it. <laughs> if, right. If, and if D-Row and D-Row and D-Row is the kind of guy who will he'll call you, too. And D-Row is just yeah. his his presence in the clubhouse. And I've been on with him at MLB Network a, a number of times and his personality you're right. He, he, he seems like he is the glue being that player guy, but just, he's so approachable, but in which he, in which he talks and interacts with players, that's a guy you want to play for. And so I think it was a brilliant idea to have him as, as the skipper because his ability to put together, not only recognize talent, um, both uh, from a baseball, from a great baseball mind, but understanding personalities and having the ability um and having the ability to bring that team together and to to make to make those calls and reach out and be like hey listen you know we uh you know we need you on this team and you know you may have been skeptical at, you know before but you know d rose a guy that can easily convince you to 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 pony up and and be a part of uh that great tournament yeah for sure no it's 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 been fun to watch like i said and I, uh, I'm excited to watch the, uh, the championship game. We'll see how things unfold here and, um, hopefully, uh, you know, selfishly a little biasly go USA, right? <laughs> yeah. Cause you're in a, you're a t- you're a tough spot tonight. So you're like, yes, stars and stripes salute. And then you got, you got your, your, the Mexican side of you right now is you know, big matchup tonight goes against both- Japan. That's yeah. That's, uh, we'll, we'll see how it unfolds, but we'll see. I'm a, well, I think it's a win-win is what I'll call it. I don't think there's any way to lose here. Right. So with that being said, four, four Pacific, seven, seven, uh, 
7 p.m. Eastern tonight. Japan is taking on Mexico, and I'm I'm gonna take uh, Japan. I just don't mm-hmm. I don't see them losing. Uh, like I said, they've been they've been untouchable this tournament, and I think we're gonna have a, like an all time legendary matchup with uh, Japan and, and the U.S. Uh, probably the two teams that have been playing the best baseball, and, and uh, the U.S. kind of breaking out of their shell, and it made me wonder a little bit. Uh, after watching the first inning of that game yesterday and them Cuba not getting a ball out of the scoring a run without hitting mm-hmm. a ball out of the infield. And I think Wayno, you know, that's one of the spring trainings. I don't know if they're doing PFPs in USA camp, but they might want to, <laughs> they, they might want to bring those back a little bit. Cause yeah. Yeah. It was uh that was not ideal, but that, oh, come on. If wayno has got to lead the league and PFPs taken over the course of his career. I mean, he, he's, he's been around the block. That's very, very true. Um, so tonight, Japan, I have Japan going through the final. And then, yep. you know, that Cuba, you know, d- destruction over Cuba last night. I think it was and I don't know wh- what it is. Um, I, I personally think Cuba was was that great of a team, but they, you know, they're they got to the semis for a reason. Um, yeah, for sure. I didn't think they were going to go very far. I didn't think they they looked beatable early on in the tournament. And I think the bats are just starting to get hot, but also I just don't think that they, that Cuba had the arms last night uh, to, I just don't think they had the, the depth of the arms and, and they show that last night with, with guys who kind of broke out after that, that early round loss. And they, you know, we were talking about the, the, the angry USA bats coming out. Yeah. And when you get that type of confidence, that's what you look for in spring training is to, is to get those hard hit balls and to build off that. And you have these truly exceptional players like who like Trout, who had the huge three, three hit night in one of the decisive games. Like that's great. That's great to see because that's not locking in for the tournament. That's something that you're looking forward to, to building those building blocks to getting ready for the season and to have sure. that, that, that mash that laser show last night. It's a, you couldn't ask for a better confidence booster going into a championship game you know, scoring, you know, 14, 14 runs in a game. Yeah, no, it's th- those guys are, you know, obviously the USA team's kind of broken out offensively. They're in a good spot. I am curious to see what happens with the uh, Japan Mexico game this evening. They got Japan has Sasaki on the mound, which like we talked about earlier, I mean, he's going to go up to hundred miles an hour as well. Um, the lefty from Anaheim, I believe is Sandoval who's going to start for Mexico. Who's got, you know, pretty dynamite stuff himself. If he's throwing the ball where he wants to, he's going to be a tough matchup for anybody. So it'll be fun to watch. I'm sure the, uh, the Yanish clan is going to be watching it here at the house. So we'll, we'll see what happens. And to know Sasaki apparently is a very nice guy with all, um, well, by the culture of Japanese, if you guys don't know, is that it's a, it's a, it's customary when you hit somebody is to tip your cap and to formally right. apologize on the field. But Sasaki Hitting one of the, the Czech Republic guys in the inside of the kneecap looked incredibly painful, and I, I winced and kind of grabbed my my knee when I saw when I saw the highlight. But a, even after the game, he was kind and generous of uh, after the game to come and yeah. greet this Czech Republic player and actually bring him sweets, apologizing for hitting, yeah. you know, dialing him up with 101 on the inside of the kneecap. Yeah, I think they exchanged uh, some paraphernalia and, and whatnot, and th- and that's another aspect. Like you know, obviously they they did the candy thing or whatever it was a bit. And then you got Shohei showing up at the press conference wearing a Czech Republic hat. You know what I mean? So you, you just, you really appreciate some of those kind of exchanges to your point earlier that maybe everybody doesn't get privy to, like, you don't, you don't get to understand exactly how, I mean, that's a significant deal for some of those guys on the Czech team to be hanging out and get to exchange some stuff with a guy like Shohei Otani or Sasaki or, you know, in, in, in all of the stuff that, the, the behind the scenes stuff that, that transpires in these types of international play tournaments is, is pretty cool. Yeah. And, you know, we can talk all about the little meaningless exhibition games. It's not, it's about great. Uh, at the end of the day, it's about growing the game and having these, you know, China, Chinese Taipei, these guys that will never step foot in a, in a major league city or have a significant opportunity to be around some of these, these great players at a, at a formal MLB spring training to step on the same field as some of these guys that are going to be future hall of famers is an incredible experience. And you see that a lot in the world cup where you have these small countries 
Um, you have you have these small countries like Iceland or Norway that don't have a lot of Premier League players or guys in the top five leagues, but to be on the field with a Messi or a Mbappe or a Neymar and to see the excitement. And to see the excitement of that jersey exchange at the end, like those stuff, you can see the joy that it brings from from these guys that that aren't necessarily on the same level, but to compete at the highest level in on an international stage and to exchange jerseys with some of the greatest players to ever play the game. That yeah. that's what makes this tournament special, and that's what the WBC is offering. Um, you, you know, every every four years is the opportunity for these guys that are teachers that are factory workers that are like tell them, you know, telecommunication specialists and right. to be on the field and to pitch, to live out their childhood dreams, to be in a, a, a major American sports venue playing against, uh, you know, perennial all-stars and hall of famers. Yeah. It's pretty cool, man. It's been, like I said, I'm, it's been fun to watch up to this point. Excited to see how the tournament unfolds, but um, overall, I think you're right. Like we've touched on the whole time. It's, it's it's really really good for the for the game of baseball globally. There's no two ways about it. And I think that and it, looking to that and speaking about it, it, it's important to note. For me, I'm interested to see what MLB does. This how they can build off the success of this. Uh, the the attendant the attendance the 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 attention the media around this tournament. I'm curious to see how this is going to they're going to continue to expand this um, and what the strategy is to grow the game of baseball international rather than just having people, you know, tune in from around the globe is how can we, how can baseball, you know, activate and mobilize these athletes to other countries in the off season to do a lot of this stuff that you see with the NBA. And, you know, there's that, you know, the, the proof is in the pudding, what the NBA has been able to accomplish over the last couple of years and having the Dirk Nowitzki's go over to Germany, to Europe and to, and you see, now you've seen the effects that it's had in promoting these international players and having these international tournaments is, you know, and, and that that's where it is. It's a, it's a weird, it's an interesting dynamic. If you've been paying attention to international to large international competitions over the years and the, the, the leagues and the leagues and um, governing bodies, their efforts to make the game more international, how right. international these countries have responded and the the level of competition in which they have got to is now incredibly is incredibly com- competitive whether it's yeah. um, international soccer you've seen it on the women's side and the influence that the that the that those teams have had abroad and the the, sh- the shrinking of the the competition gap particularly on the, the international nba stage and once we can, you know, we can get back out to Europe, I think that that will continue to grow and they can close this competitive gap with some of the European countries, because we always know that baseball in Asia is going to be is going to be a big thing. You know, Chinese Taipei, they have a professional league over there, sure, but it's not necessarily as big in, in Europe. Um, so I'd be really curious if, if that if that is a route that they take is be able to have these young stars of the game go over there and really get out into the community and get into that, um, you know, get into that, that baseball landscape. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I, I think some of that's going to be organic though, right? Like you, you need, you need a, a guy or two from somewhere to, to make it right. And then to like have, like you talk about Dirk Nowitzki, right. He's, he's got vested interest to take it back to where he's from. And I, I think that that's a little bit of the way that I, to your point about going and being around those seven and eight year olds, you know, 10, 12 years ago, and then now seeing what happened, I think there's going to be a little bit of a buffer period of, okay, and we're, we're in the middle of it, right? The WB start, C started, I think, whatever it was, 2006 was the first one. Um, and we've seen how much, how it's grown exponentially up to this point. I think that'll continue to happen, but I think that the, the global growth is going to be a little organic, but at the same time with social media and the way that, you know, everything can be everywhere instantly, it's, it's, it's going it, to, it's happening fast. I think we're watching it happen. So it's cool. That's a that's a good point. And I didn't think about that. If you, you know, op, fast forwarding, you know, 15 years from 2006, social media and YouTube, they weren't they weren't as prevalent mm-hmm. now. But the stuff that that people are being able to pick yeah. up and from a development standpoint, I mean, your kids can go on YouTube and watch in slow mo, slow right. motion. And this is the stuff that we had talked about that we talked about Joey doing in 2006 and just being on MLB.com and how much how difficult Wi-Fi not being where it is, um, the, you know, 
just telecommunications yeah. and Wi-Fi not being where it is and having to go back and like rebuffer this, you know, Barry Bond swing, Todd Helton at, at bats. You can go on YouTube and, you know, yeah. watch slow-mo swings and break down Trey Turner's, um, Trey Turner's right. home, home run from the other night. And that's a great example, man. You're, you're exactly right. Like my kids do that right now. And I've, like, I'm joking, but we're, he's in the living room trying to, you know, be impersonate Trey Turner or impersonate Bo Bichette or, you know, whatever the case is, but he's doing that from an obviously a very young age, which it's, it's, it's no different, I guess, in some ways than a big league player watching other big leaguers, but it is different because they're, that's getting typed into the database from the get go. And, you know, it's, it's what we're probably going to see is a bunch of clones and, and, a, <laughs> and, in, in 10, 12 years, looking like current big leaguers in different bodies, but not, not everybody can do what Trey Turner does, but I'm just telling you. <laughs> yeah. But with that being said, just the, the root, the, you know, the root of um, just the, the fundamentals and the structure of the swing is something that, that you know, we didn't have, but you know, sure. with the, the camera angles and the slow-mo and the high res the high res cameras. And I, I will say this, if we just, since we're, we're talking about development, I was in Arizona this past weekend and it's interesting to see if we're talking about technology where just the analytic, not just from an analytic standpoint, as far as stats, but, but performance in, uh, but actual just performance, physical performance, delivery, monitoring, uh, you know, RPM, pitching grips, angles, all that stuff. And I was, mm -hmm. I was at the Milwaukee Brewers complex and it looked like, it looked like a science lab. And so yep. there, there's this weird dynamic. There's this weird contrast that I was discussing with uh, Carlos uh, Villanueva, former great Brewers pitcher, former All Star, yeah. and yeah. Uh, he's now a pitching development coordinator in Milwaukee. And I asked him about the the, the cameras, and you have the uh, the track man behind the catcher, and then you have the high res cameras and the yeah. guys on the computers. And I I and I asked him like, dude, what is going on here? It looks like a science lab in here. He's like, yeah. A guy who is in this, you know, who was in this, this transformation of not having any of that to being at the tail of his career when it's just getting introduced and now being fully, fully invested in it and surrounded by it on a daily basis where you have two pitching coaches, you have a development, you have an analytics, analytics specialist all watching a, a side bullpen yeah. um, in the middle of the week is, is, is interesting. That's, you know, it's where we're at and I get it. But it, uh, it's probably it's probably a whole show in itself, honestly, man, because I'm we're, we're pretty adept at that at our place, too. And it's 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 just prevalent in the game. That's just the way that it is. I think it's not an accident that you've seen some of these organizations, whether it's Tampa, the Dodgers, the Astros, Milwaukee's done a really good job of late, um, have a lot of success with pitchers specifically. But I think the really telling um, deal is when you have a pitcher that's been somewhere else or maybe has been in the big leagues, somewhat of a journeyman, so to speak, and they go to one of these places and kind of have a resurrection of their career, it's hard for me to believe that that's an accident, right? So there's, there's definitely some art to the science, but there's, there's those, those, some of those people are really implementing a lot of that technology in a really, really effective way that is a competitive advantage, you know? Yeah, hundred percent. We talked about this earlier about the number of guys that are throwing a uh, hundred miles per hour, and yeah, it's not by it's not we're getting bigger, stronger, faster. It's the it's the training techniques, hundred percent. And an interesting story. You remember Alex Cobb uh, yep. from from the Tampa Bay, longtime big leaguer, and probably one of my favorite pitchers to pitch because he just he's very slow and methodical, and it barely looks like he's putting any effort into when he's throwing. It just it just looks like he's just playing catch on a Sunday. He's always been like a 90, 92. He'll run it up to 94. Great curveball change up. Two seamer will work both sides of the plate. And I think he got to a point where he's kind of fallen off a little bit. He couldn't get his velocity back. And he said, listen, I'm kind of at this point in my career where, you know, what what, what do I have to lose? What do I have to lose at this yeah. point? Let me go to yeah. a, a driveline performance center. Let me go to this performance center and let me see what I got. Let me see if I can, you know, gain a couple extra miles per hour um, because, you know, I can either kind of just drown it out and end my career like this, or I can make a last ditch attempt to resurrect and, and, and put myself yeah. in a place to really compete. And he did that. And I, I saw one of his starts last, last year on TV and I, I saw him in San Francisco and we were talking about it. And he, he said exactly that. He was like, you know, what do, what do I have to lose? I can be a 91, 92 guy and just maybe get put into the bullpen and just kind of get outs here and there. Or I can, you know, fully commit to something. And now he's at 95, 96. And so 
you know, again, proof is in the pudding. The technology's there. Um, you see it. You see it now. And I know for you, I think the interesting thing is when do you introduce the the little monsters to that type of stuff? You we want them to be going from the the pro level, seeing where the seeing where the big league level is at, knowing where you're at at the college, the collegiate level at Rice, and how this starts to factor in. And you know me, like I've always been. I've been a big guy in the gym, a big training guy, yeah. and you know it ekes the shit out of me to see <clears throat> nine and ten year olds uh, doing personal training sessions. And so, from a just from a sheer baseball development point, when do you when do you go to that hitting coach and that driveline facility to to break to start breaking down your kids' swings? Yeah, it's a tough question. I think I think it's I don't think it's a black and white answer. I think it depends on the kid, right? Obviously, they develop physically at different times. They develop mentally at different times. Like I think a big factor in going to a hitting coach is going to be body awareness and the ability to make your body do what you want it to do and understand how it moves. And like, I know for me right now, my kids aren't there yet. Like I, we're, we're still better off saying, Hey man, try to hit the ball far. Hey, try to hit, you know, some of those types of things, hit the ball hard. Let's work on hitting using the barrel every time before we start getting too mechanical. And I need you to know exactly where that back elbow is in the slot. And, you know, I, there's, it's, 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 it's tough because in this, current landscape of youth sports it, it kind of people get carried away at least in my opinion um i'm a little callous to it because i do operate in the college game and recruiting and so i get to see a bunch of i probably have a unique perspective on it i guess but with my own kids it's you know i i think that the best thing that they can do is like what we're talking about like you're probably going to get as much out of watching as much big league players play because they do it right on accident. You know, I mean, not on accident, but they do it right. So trying to emulate them, I think, is as beneficial in some ways at a young age of typing it into the database of like what it looks like and how their bodies move and like those types of things, as is trying to make them, you know, paying paying a bunch of money to get them into a cage with a guy who's going to try to help them hit off of a tee, if that makes sense. And, you know, it's, it's not a black and white answer. I think it varies for the kid. I, you know, like my kid's, as the example, have a super unique exposure to the game of baseball. You know, I, fortunately I got to play long enough to where they were in the clubhouse with, you know, Manny Machado and Adam Jones and Jonathan scope in Baltimore. And, you know, they still remember some of that stuff. And then now I'm at the college level, they get to go into the clubhouse with a bunch of college guys at the, at the division one level. And it's, so their, their, their exposure is unique. Not everybody has that. I I understand that, but um, so I don't know. I, I, I think, I think the big deal from an early age, you want to try to make sure that they're enjoying it and having fun to a certain degree. I always joke about it. Like at least my, my oldest son is 11 and at least up to this point, they're still learning a whole lot more than baseball at this point. You know, there's all kinds of dugout dynamics and, you know, the kids that aren't going to play baseball for very much longer and being a good teammate and, you know, not throwing your helmet after you get out, you know, there's a bunch of different stuff that, that you can incorporate into this conversation. But so I kind of got off on a tangent there. Sorry. No, I mean, that's fine. I mean, that's a, it's a beauty. It's just the beauty of sports and just going back to just seeing at the base level and just always understanding that with all of this, all of this peripheral stuff with, with hitting coaches and, 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 and getting broken down to this granular, granular level, you know, youth baseball, it's just, it's the, I mean, you've, you've seen, you see it on TV. It's no, it's no different to what's happening with a bunch of guys that don't play together from different teams that are often rivals. And they've probably slid into each other at second base. They've probably been each other in playoff games and to get, to put that aside, that's the beauty of sports, but that's also a huge dynamic of, of, of youth development and being in sports in general is understanding how to play, how to be a a collective to get to a greater to, a, a, to achieve a, a greater goal, which is to right. go out, have fun together, win baseball games. But all the, also for young kids is, is, um, is, you know, it's just how to handle yourself dealing with adversity. Sure. And yeah. that, that's a unique thing. So at the, at the highest level, it's understanding where we're at, where we need to get to uh, doing the things that make you a great teammate, you know, supporting. And from the, from the, at the 10 year old, 11 year old, it's still the same thing. It's always the same underlying thing of how we we're able to, to, to get together, to operate as a team, uh, to do the bet to best, the best that we can and have a fun atmosphere. Yeah. Cause it's, 
when you get into some of these places, when you have that type of tension, which I'm sure that the, the DR had with, you know, guys not playing. Sure. I, I would have to imagine that had something to do with their, with their demise. And, um, but that's me speaking from 3000 miles away. That's right. That's right. 30,000 foot view. Exactly. So oh. Polly, I think that's our time for today. We're at that 45 good, minute mark yeah. and for everybody out there, again, if you're tuning in, thank you once again. Go give us a like, subscribe, leave us a review. Uh, the visual is available on YouTube on the Believe channel. Go shout out, go give us a shout out over there. Again, drop us something in the comments, things that we'll be yep. uh, discussing next week, uh, in which I think we already have one of our topics of conversation is there's a little note that just dropped today about uh, potentially – uh, offloading Joey at the all-star break and the, the openness uh, that uh, Reds GM Nick Kroll has expressed in particularly uh, trading away Joey to the, to the Jays. So we'll touch on that uh, yeah. next week, but for everybody, happy Monday, enjoy the week. Paul Yanish. I'll be seeing you pal. Dickie as usual. It was a, it was a blast, bud. See you soon. <laughs>